Now, I always figured this time would be a little bit tricky, but I, you know, we'll see how many people we get. Uh, it's uh, it's it's going to be an interesting one today. Uh, sorry, it's so early. By the way, I try and aim for a time when everyone can make it, but today I uh, I'm going to catch a train and take a little mini holiday for the weekend. So this is the reason I have to go early. Uh, so apologies for that. I'm going to be covering COPD and NIV, uh, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about oxygen because I think fundamentally when you're discussing uh, ventilation issues and uh, respiratory failure, it's kind of impossible not to cover a little bit about oxygen. I think we still got three minutes, so it doesn't need to be right now, right now that I'll start. I'll just leave this screen on and mute myself for another two minutes because I can see people are just kind of regularly joining. In the meantime, as we have a couple of minutes, if there are any clinical questions or anything about any of the SBAs on uh, the uh, Instagram, if anyone's following them, uh, do let me know in the chat. I'm gonna leave the chat open for two minutes and I'm gonna close it. The point will be that uh, while I'm presenting, I can't actually look at the chat. At the end of uh, this, I will take any questions uh, if that's right. So if I'm not responding to your question immediately, it's only because well, it's not feasible and I can't see your question uh, in the chat while I'm presenting. Okay, so if, please, if you have any questions, put it in there and I will respond as soon as I have a moment. Or if you've got a question now I can respond to, I'll take it just before we begin. Uh, and ooh, what is the indication? <laughs> well, there's a question about uh, Roflumilast, which I am gonna be discussing a little bit today. So I'm gonna come to that um, and, uh, and we'll, come, uh, we'll come on to that. It's one of the new uh, medications. It's a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor uh, that can be used in COPD. And it's a, new, uh, it's a new medication for patients with stable COPD, which is moderate to severe, and it can be considered to reduce exacerbation frequency. The problem with that medication is essentially that it's in the European guidelines, but I don't believe it's in the British guidelines yet, but we do see it used. Uh, relatively frequently. So we can come on to that in a little bit. Um, there is a, the, the short answer to your question is there is no firm indication, uh, at least uh, that I'm aware of in the British guidelines. I think it's to be considered, uh, but then lots of things can be considered in moderate to severe COPD. We'll come on to that. Got a fantastic question from Nicholas here. Everyone can see it. Are there any cardiac complications associated with COPD? Oh, you are exactly in my wheelhouse, Nicholas. I am gonna be talking about that uh, today and it'll form an interesting bit of this conversation. So I'm gonna come back to that because that's an excellent question. Okay, fine. Well, thank you, first of all. This is nine o'clock. Thank you, everyone, for joining us already. It's 62 people, which is way more than I was expecting. I gotta be honest, for a Saturday morning. I have to be completely honest with you. When I was in final, uh, in my final year, uh, you couldn't get me out of bed for any amount of money on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock. Uh, so I have to say you are better people than I, and I clearly am a better person than I was because I'm, I'm here at nine o'clock. So, uh, thank you for indulging me. I have to catch a train for the ones who are joining. This is the reason I have to start a little bit earlier today. There's not going to be many SBAs today. This is a little bit more didactic. It's a bit more clinical. I have a fair bit to cover because I'm also going to cover NIV and oxygen. And uh, it's an interesting topic. So I'm going to try and minimize the uh, interactive SBAs just for uh, this particular tutorial. But then I'm kind of always experimenting and seeing how things go. All right, fine. So let's begin with a little bit of inspection. All right. Now this is a video I've nicked from YouTube. So I'm hoping I'm not gonna get in trouble for this because if you Google uh, COPD on YouTube, 
I am pretty an actress, so it's not terrible. And Novartis video uh, from the drug company with someone with CO. What we're looking at when you've got some, I want you to notice a couple of things. Inspection is the key to kind of all of medicine, all right? What we're looking at here is a lady who is short of breath, yeah? You're looking at accessory muscle use. You can see how prolonged the expiratory phase of respiration is. Uh, there is also some personal breathing, uh, which is absolutely accurate. But just look at how she's breathing. She's using her entire shoulders to breathe. And she's also using the sternocleidomastoids. There's a bit of a cough at the end. Uh, probably, I'm hoping this is an actress, uh, probably just uh, for dramatic effect. But what I want you to notice is that this act is doing an excellent job because when she breathes, the entire neck kind of inflates and deflates, which shows you she's actually looking really hard to try and generate negative pressure inside the chest to the point where you're actually getting intercession of the muscles at the top of the neck uh, and the skin but the chest wall doesn't actually move that much there is very minimal movement in that chest wall despite the amount of effort she's using this is pretty inefficient uh, ventilation ventilation basically so you put in all that energy but your chest wall barely moves now you're sitting at home listening to me right if i asked you to breathe with your whole body really try and breathe you will notice that your chest wall actually moves quite a lot because with your diaphragm, with your stomach, if you really tried to go for it and try to shift a lot of, lot of volume of air into your lungs in and out, you, I bet you could double or triple it. But the, this lady unable to because of her fundamental pathology, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Patients have two major issues going on. One of them is chronic inflammation or bronchitis. And that's partly because, well, the commonest cause of COPD is smoking. So I put smoke there, but there are other causes, of course. Uh, coal uh, inhalation, coal tar inhalation is one of them. So it used to be something you'd see among coal miners. Uh, but of course, this is a job that's just not uh, around anymore. So we don't see it that much, at least in the UK. Uh, and that's thanks to Margaret Thatcher, uh, who was this, uh, who, who basically shut down all the coal mines. Uh, hashtag politics. Uh, there's loss of elastic recoil. Uh, and that's the other major problem that's going on. You've got destruction of lung parenchyma and you lose your elastic recoil. And what that means is effectively, when you take a deep breath in, you're relying on elastic recoil to empty your lungs. So it's great having all the muscle in the world because muscle will allow air to come into the lungs, but to exhale air out, to expel air from the lung volume, what you're relying on is that your, uh, that your parenchyma basically uh, snaps back. So you need that elastic recoil to get rid of the air. So if you can't do that, you get air trapping, uh, which is a, uh, a slightly more layman's way of saying that what you're getting is patients have hyperexpansion of the lungs. And that's another key feature in COPD. Those are the two major things that's going on. And pretty much everything that goes wrong in COPD can be explained by those two things. Effectively, what you end up happening if you have chronic inflammation and loss of elastic recoil is you get respiratory failure. And then you might also get some signs of compensation as your body tries to kind of have it both ways and think, okay, fine, the lungs aren't working, but we can compensate for this with some other things. And those compensatory mechanisms will be things to improve your oxygen uh, carrying capacity. So you might get a secondary polycythemia. <clears throat> so what are the major signs at the end of the bed for COPD? Now I'm talking about this um, as if this is the COPD station for medical finals. I've examined for medical finals multiple times. For some bizarre reason, they've given me the respiratory station multiple times to examine. Uh, and COPD patients are very, very common. They're really common because a lot of people smoke. Uh, a lot of people were smoking in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So these people are now at the right age uh, to have you know, moderate to severe COPD with relatively stable symptoms in, often, in most cases. And they can be brought with their relatively stable symptoms to medical finals and be put as a case with great signs at the end of the bed uh, to review. So we like COPD patients for finals. Uh, it's, it's a nice respiratory case. I have to say for respiratory, this respiratory station in finals can only be like one of five cases. It's gonna be COPD, it's gonna be bronchiectasis, it's gonna be lung fibrosis or fibrotic lung disease or interstitial lung disease, or it's gonna be some patient with previous pneumonectomy or some kind of nice big scar on the chest to look at. That's pretty much all it can be. There are some very rare things, but I've never frankly seen them uh, come up, uh, although you do hear rumors about them in other universities now and then. So the signs in a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are, well, the, the most important um, mark, which everyone seems to forget in exams, and I promise you, no matter how zen you are walking into a final station, 
the minute you're faced with an examiner, especially if it's your first station, you will panic. Uh, and most people panic and just start the exam. The most important thing you should do in your final station for your OSCEs or your cases is stop. Well, you kind of, I presume you've introduced yourself, introduced yourself to the patient, consented and washed your hands and all that. The single most important thing which then must happen is you move to the end of the bed and just look at the patient dead on from the end of the bed. Inspection is done from the end of the bed. I know it's pointless to, to do it that way. There is no good reason why you can't inspect just as well standing next to the patient. But I'm speaking as an old school examiner here. Not that I particularly care, but I know other examiners who do. And so you have to remember some people uh, have been retired from medicine for 30 years and only come back to medical school now to examine for finals and they like to see their medical students do the little dance that they had to do 50 years ago. So move to the end of the bed and take three seconds to inspect from the end of the bed because it's something every examiner likes to see. It's just very old school and that's how we should do it. So what you're looking at is a patient uh, from the end of the bed. Um, to be honest, the very first thing you'll notice is the fact that the patient's probably breathless and unwell. That's the only two things at the end of the bed that you can really tell, right, immediately. Is the patient well or unwell? And are they breathless or not? That's it. And you don't actually need to be a doctor to know any of that. You can see whether they're breathless or not. And you can kind of tell from a sixth sense whether the patient is well or unwell. Uh, you might see some purpura or some striae, which might be signs of steroid use because patients with COPD often get multiple courses of steroids, especially if they have anything beyond moderate severity COPD, which is defined by a couple of exacerbations a year or more. So they can have steroid use signs and they might even be frankly cushing or if they have very very advanced uh, uh, COPD and have lots and lots of steroid courses. Patients may well be plethoric. They might have secondary polycythemia and their face may have this kind of darkish reddish color. If they are hypoxic, then they'll be blue looking, blue tinged. This is a little uh, aside here, but um, I have a question and I suppose this is best answered on the chat. I'll open it on the corner. Uh, can anyone tell me, uh, uh, how do I frame this question without making it really obvious what the answer is? Da, 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 da. Okay, in a hypoxic patient with anemia, what color would you expect them to be? This gives me a chance to take a sip of my coffee. The question is, if you have a anemic patient who's hypoxic, yeah, anemic patient, hemoglobin of six or whatever, who's hypoxic, what color would you expect them to be in the end of the bed? Someone says pale, someone says pale, 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 normal color, pale, reddish. Yeah, so the, the fundamental thing is, if you're hypoxic, the reason you sometimes look blue is the deoxyhemoglobin looks blue. What that means is, if you don't have enough hemoglobin to have enough deoxyhemoglobin, which is blue, then you will never look blue if you're anemic. What that means is just because a patient doesn't look blue doesn't mean they're not hypoxic. It could be that they're so anemic that they don't look blue. Does that make sense? You need enough hemoglobin in your body to actually generate enough deoxyhemoglobin in the event of hypoxia to actually look blue. So at the end of the bed, just because someone isn't blue doesn't necessarily mean that their oxygen levels are normal. It might be that they're very anemic and hypoxic, which is of course a terrible combination to have. So this is the issue uh, to have uh, in, in clinical medicine is that the blue discoloration doesn't necessarily mean uh, does, isn't necessarily the only indicator of hypoxia. You have to kind of assume that the hemoglobin is something above 10 to generate enough dehoxyhemoglobin to look blue. Patients will be short of breath at rest, right? There'll be use of accessory muscles, like that lady that we just saw, intercession of ribs, use of diaphragm, sternal clidomastoids. The thing is uh, to say accessory muscle use is fine for an average medical student, but if you're being taught by me, you're not an average medical student. So I'd expect you to give me uh, some accessory muscles if I stop you and say what accessory muscles have been used. So you could say intercession of the ribs, you can say use of the diaphragm, you can use, say use of the abdominal muscles, you can say sternal clidomastoids. The patients may be leaning forward. This is often the thing that you'll notice once you graduate in particular, because you'll be on the uh, medical take. In medical jobs, you'll see so many patients with COPD coming to hospital. And one of the things you'll notice is that once they get really breathless or they have an exacerbation, they start leaning forward. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Partly, you're trying to have gravity assist you with some of the chest wall movement by just leaning forward. You are trying to get gravity to help you expand the chest wall out. That's just part of you. That's just something you're learning to do 
uh, just because you feel like it improves your ventilatory effort a little bit. And part of it is the fact that if you're leaning forward, you can use a lot more of your abdomen, especially if you're quite obese, leaning forward might make it a little bit easier to shift your diaphragm down. Uh, there may be signs of an obstructive defect at the bedside. One of the great bedside tests of COPD, which is pretty, almost diagnostic, is to just ask the patient to take a deep breath in all the way in and then breathe out hard and fast until there's nothing left in their chest. Now, if I asked you to do that at home, I reckon you can probably breathe all the way in, yeah? And the amount of time it takes you to breathe hard and fast until your chest is empty, hard and fast, just go really fast out, yeah? I reckon you could all do it in under three seconds. Most of you will probably do it in under two seconds, actually, uh, because you have nice, healthy lungs with good elastic recoil. But if you asked a patient with COPD to do that, what would happen? They'd just go, and now I'm simulating a wheeze. But basically, they'd have this prolonged expiratory phase, and they'd be this long bit of breathing out, and you might even hear an audible wheeze when they do that. And that wheeze and that expanded uh, time it takes to breathe out is telling you that they have an obstructive defect. There is something obstructing um, airflow as they try and breathe out. And that's what an obstructive defect is. In fact, what you're doing is a, a cheap version of spirometry, right? You're looking at their FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second, but you're just under seeing the full uh, kind of time it takes to breathe all the way out. What you're doing is effectively a very cheap version of, uh, of spirometry by doing this. You might find that they're personally breathing. I'm gonna come back to that because personally breathing is such an important uh, bedside sign to pick up. And it's in fact, the fundamental reason why NIV was even invented is that personal breathing is a thing. We're gonna come back to that. In the hands, you're gonna find a bounding pulse. A bounding pulse is a sign of CO2 retention. It can also be a sign of, uh, of high upward cardiac failure and multiple other things, aortic regurgitation. In the context of a respiratory station, a patient with a bounding pulse normally means that they have uh, probably some CO2 retention. And that's because CO2 retention uh, induces a bit of uh, acidemia in the blood and that causes peripheral vasodilatation and you can get a bounding pulse for the same reasons you can get red palms where uh, and signs of uh, severe CO2 narcosis includes a flap but that's fairly late on. You might find in the hands that there's some tar staining. Um, some books will mention nicotine staining. Yeah, that's bullshit. There is no such thing as nicotine staining. Nicotine is colorless. So if it is in your books, throw the book away because the book is wrong. Nicotine does not stain. Uh, it's the tar that actually gives you that yellowish staining. So I know it's a little bit pedantic and a lot of doctors will still say nicotine staining, uh, but there's no reason every one of you should be wrong as well. Uh, the color that you're seeing is caused by tar, not nicotine. Nicotine is colorless. In the neck, you'll find signs of a raised JVP. And this is true of anyone with uh, any clinically significant chronic obstructive airways disease for a while. Uh, and the reason you're getting an elevated JVP is you're seeing a sign of right heart failure uh, and core pulmonale, okay? So that is the most obvious bedside sign is that you get a JVP elevation. I want you to look for it. I don't want you to ignore it just because it's not a cardiac station. A uh, sign of an LVJ is incredibly important. Yeah. If you get down to the chest, there'll be a hyper-expanded chest, but with reduced expansion. So what that means is the chest looks massive. Now, there are two ways to describe that to the examiner. One is you can do the cricosternal distance. The other one is looking at the AP diameter, the anterior posterior diameter. So I have to be honest, I personally have never for exams ever done the cricosternal distance. I know that less than three finger breaths is uh, a sign of a hyperexpanded chest. I just always felt it looked a bit fiddly. If I'm demonstrating hyperexpansion at the examiner, I'd much rather just use my eyes and look at the patient from the side and see that the AP diameter of the chest is increased. The fundamental thing is picking up the sign and showing to the examiner that you understand how to look for hyperexpansion. There are two ways to do it. I personally think the AP diameter is a bit better than cricosternal distance, but whatever floats your boat. If you've always done it that way, then, uh, then feel free, as long as you do it one way or the other. Uh, and the reduced expansion simply means that while their chest is massive, their chest doesn't move very much when they breathe in and out. And that's why they're having to use accessory muscles, right? They might have this huge expanded chest, which is really bigger than yours or mine, but you put your hands on their chest and ask them to breathe in and out, and there's very little movement. This is because they're air trapping. They've lost their elastic recoil and this is inefficient ventilation. So there is air trapped lung there with reduced expansion, but it is hyper expanded. Does that make sense? Uh, so that's why there's that dichotomy of, uh, of the two major findings. There may be reduced breath sounds as well. 
because it's such a hyper expanded chest which suck they're just not shifting that much uh, that much airflow in there. They're really not moving it that much. And therefore the breath sounds might not be massive to hear. You might hear the audible wheeze. It may not be there if the patient is nicely controlled uh, on their medications. Although anyone with moderate to severe COPD or worse, which is what we would bring to exams, will probably have a wheeze pretty much all the time. It's some bit of their chest. So you might well hear some. And finally, you might see some peripheral edema and that's another sign of right heart failure. Major complications of patients with COPD are obviously chest infection. That's the infective exacerbation of COPD, which is the kind of bread and butter of what acute medics see so frequently on the take. Respiratory failure. And core pulmonary. Now, I was asked earlier uh, in the chat, just before I started, what are the cardiac complications of uh, COPD? COPD patients do have an increased risk of uh, acute coronary syndrome and heart attacks. We, uh, I'm, as a cardiologist, I see a lot of patients with COPD. Of course, part of that is the fact that if you're a smoker so bad that you've been damaging your lungs, almost certainly you're going to have some atherosclerotic heart disease somewhere, right? Like that's just goes with the territory of the fact that you're smoking. That's not the COPD itself, uh, I don't believe. But there is definitely an increased risk of acute coronary syndrome because they, these are smokers and they tend to have steroids. So it's not the best kind of cardiovascular risk factor profile you can imagine. So that's one thing. Fundamentally, the biggest complication and the thing that leads to death, if you don't die from chest infection uh, or respiratory failure, or cancer, which is the final complication here I'm gonna put in, then you will pretty much with COPD, once it gets advanced enough, die from heart failure. There's actually, we can treat the chest infection. You can treat the respiratory failure up to an extent. You can even treat the cancer. Once you have right heart failure, core pulmonary, right ventricular failure, you cannot treat that. There is no treatment for that. The only treatment for that is really heart transplant. And in this case, it would have to be heart and lung transplant. So it's not something that's feasibly treatable. Uh, and this is a moment where Ritesh gets to take out his Apple pencil and practice drawing. So if I explain to you why this is happening, it's actually really straightforward, right? Like, I wonder, I think you can see this. Okay, that's the heart. This is the right side. This is the left side. The thing we're concerned about is the right heart failing. So I'm worried about this right ventricle. The right ventricle gives off your pulmonary artery to the two lungs. Now, if your lungs, kind of like this, are diseased, you have pulmonary vascular disease, okay? So if you have diseased lungs, and this can be diseased from any chronic condition, this would apply to bronchiectasis. Interstitial lung disease in particular actually is really bad. So fibrotic lungs, worse than all of the others I'm going to talk about, but also COPD bronchiectasis. Uh, if you have that, then what you get effectively is pulmonary hypertension. I hope that kind of makes sense. Your alveoli are damaged. And in the most simplistic way to put it, the alveoli are being surrounded by a capillary network. And if they're damaged, then all the capillaries are damaged. Therefore, there is resistance to blood flow in the pulmonary artery and you get uh, pulmonary vascular resistance going up. And that's what pulmonary hypertension is. Once you get pulmonary hypertension, yeah, I'm now going to focus just on the right ventricle. So this is your pulmonary artery. So the blood pressure in the pulmonary artery is high. You have increased pulmonary pressures or pulmonary hypertension. Then your right ventricle is struggling to squeeze blood into this normally very nicely compliant lung vasculature. And what's gonna end up happening is your heart will try and compensate for that. It will, to try and push with a little bit harder, it's gonna go, you're gonna have some right ventricular hypertrophy, okay? With right ventricular hypertrophy, you will also get increased pressures in the right ventricle. Some of that is going to transmit up to the right atrium, and you're going to see increased column of blood here, which is going to be visible to you as a high JVP, because the JVP is just a single column of blood that goes from the jugular vein all the way down to the right atrium. A high JVP only tells you one thing, which is that the right atrial pressure is high. That's all it's telling you. It doesn't say anything about fluid overload. The JVP being high means that the right atrial pressure is high. Now, the, one of the causes of that is, a, uh, is fluid overload, but the other cause could be that they have right heart failure and increased pressures on the right side. So that's all a JVP is. It's just a manometer of blood that's telling you what is the right atrial pressure. Okay, so your JVP will be high. If you've got right heart failure, one of the things is the JVP is high. The JVP is connected to the SVC, 
but your pressure will also be high in the IVC, which means that you will get some fluid backlog in the IVC, which means you will get congestion of fluid, everything that the IVC is draining, which will include the liver. Eventually, they can get a waterlogged liver. And if they've got properly bad uh, pulmonary hypertension, they will get tricuspid regurgitation from the excess fluid, and they'll get a pulsatile liver. Earlier than that, they'll probably get some backlog of, uh, uh, of fluid in the lower extremities, and you'll see that as peripheral edema or even ascites. And all of those are signs of right heart failure. So fluid overload visible as peripheral edema, ascites, uh, pleural effusions, all of these are signs of right heart failure. None of them are left heart failure. There is only one real sign of left heart failure, uh, which uh, out of that huge list of heart failure stuff that medical students learn, and that is pulmonary edema. That's left heart failure. Everything else, peripheral edema, elevated JVP, all of that stuff is right heart failure. So this is something that to be just really clear about as a medical student, because I have to say, uh, to be honest, as a medical student, I wasn't particularly well explained. Uh, this wasn't well explained to me. So I'm hoping this, this clarifies a little bit. Uh, I am so sorry, guys. I can see the chat's going, but it's closed. So I can't look at it because it'll kind of obstruct uh, the slides for me. So I will go through them at the end if that's all right. Uh, and I will go through that again if that's the if that's the concern. So signs of core pulmonary include pulmonary, uh, uh, signs of core pulmonary, which is basically just pulmonary hypertension. Core pulmonary is just Latin for heart because of lungs, right? That's all what core pulmonary means. So it's secondary to pulmonary hypertension. You'll see a raised JVP. You might get a loud palpable P2, which is a loud pulmonary component of the second heart sound. I have to tell you, it's one of my favorite findings in medicine. I don't know what yours is, but for me, it's a loud P2. A loud P2 uh, is this. When we finish this talk and you're really bored and you're like, you know what, I could go out and have some fun or I could just take my stethoscope and listen to myself. Take your stethoscope and put it in your ears and listen to your aortic valve area and the pulmonary valve area. One of the things you will notice is that the aortic valve area, the lub dub, the dub is louder uh, over the aortic valve area than the pulmonary valve area. That's normal. Your aortic component of the second heart sound should be louder than the pulmonary component of the second heart sound, which kind of makes sense because your aorta is dealing with 120 systolic, whereas your, whereas your pulmonary artery should be dealing with 25 systolic. So actually, because your aorta is dealing with higher pressure of blood, and actually sits a little bit in, anteriorly in the chest, it should be louder. So in all of you, the aortic component of the second heart sound, which is what A2 means, should be louder than the P2, which is the pulmonary component of the second heart sound. In patients with pulmonary hypertension, it's the other way around. They have a loud and more prominent pulmonary component of the second heart sound. So for you to work out if someone's got a loud P2, it's really easy. Just listen to A2 and P2 and tell me which one's louder. If the P2, if the pulmonary valve closure is louder, then they have a loud P2, and you've just picked up a great sensitive sign for pulmonary hypertension at the bedside. Okay. And beyond that, you can get a right ventricular heave. This is a bit more tricky to pick up because you really need to know what a heave feels like. Pulmonary regurge, tricuspid regurge, you might pick that up uh, in patients who have uh, with a pulsatile liver. Pulmonary regurge is a bit tough to hear, but then I always cheat. I don't use, I haven't used stethoscope for like six years. I use an echo machine for everything because I, I cheat. Uh, peripheral edema is a great sign. Everyone can see that. Ascites, peripheral effusions. Uh, and those are all complications of COPD. Ah, they might, and this is the other one. This is for, okay, so I know some of you were taught finals by me last year, so you're cheating because I know you are now doctors. I, I can recognize some of the names in there. I don't mind. Of course, you're very welcome. This is a finals talk, but since I've been noticing some people beyond finals coming to this, uh, first of all, I'm flattered or slightly worried that you need you feel like you need me to be taught again by me because clearly something went wrong the first time. Um, but if you are here for MRCP and a bit beyond, then, okay, the only difference between a student fi and finals and MRCP is this experience. That's all it is. A good finally medical student and a good MRCP candidate are very, very similar people. It's just that the MRCP person has been on medical take and knows how to make decisions. So, you're thinking one step beyond finals and you're thinking what's going to kill this patient in the next week, month, and year. Whereas the finals patient, uh, student is thinking, how do I diagnose this patient, come up with a management plan to keep them alive through the night effectively? That's kind of the difference between finals and MRCP. So if you're thinking as a doctor, seeing a patient with COPD, the other complication you should be aware of is the fact that they have recurrent courses of steroids as part of their treatment, and they may well have some complications from that. 
which will include osteoporosis. They may well get Cushingoid. And of course, lots of steroid courses frequently uh, will cause GI bleeding. And of course, with the Cushings comes everything which includes hypertension, uh, easy bruising, diabetes, all that stuff. Okay, let me clear all this stuff. Sorry, uh, I'm trying something new, which is using my iPad simultaneously with my laptop to present this. So the iPad lets me draw stuff. Okay, to end your presentation, which is the thing bit where medical students say to complete my exam, I'd like to, and, and normally I have to be honest with you, exam is zone out at this point because everyone says exactly the same thing. Just say something that makes sense. Um, uh, can I suggest don't say chest x-ray? I really hate it when medical students say I'd like to get a chest x-ray in every patient. I just think irradiating the chest uh, and giving them a risk of cancer in the future is not really good as a doctor unless you, you can justify it. So unless you've got something very specific you're looking for a chest x-ray, don't just say I'd like to get a routine chest x-ray. That's just not a thing doctors do, uh, at least uh, outside America. So get a peak flow, which is kind of kind of rubbish. A bedside spirometry is better. So get a bedside spirometry, I would say, because let's elevate our game and get spirometry. Uh, get, uh, get a sputum sample if, you can, if the patient's coughing. Uh, check the temperature because infections are common. So uh, chest infections and COPD exacerbation, et cetera. So get a temperature. Causes of COPD, smoking is the biggest cause. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, alpha antitrypsin deficiency is a really, really important cause. You will run into it. It's not that common, but it is very important. And it's important in finals uh, because these patients have early onset emphysema uh, and bronchiectasis eventually. They, they have signs of COPD much earlier than you would expect. And of course it's magnified in smokers, but even if they're non-smokers, they get this. The thing that's odd here is the liver involvement. There are very few conditions in medicine that will involve lungs and liver, okay? And this is one of them. Uh, the only other one that springs to mind straight away, as I said, lungs and liver, uh, this is with my medical SBA writing hat on, would be amiodarone because it can cause uh, liver cirrhosis and it can cause interstitial lung disease. So as a side effect, amiodarone can potentially affect both, but I'd expect a bit of rash in those patients as well. So it's very unusual to get liver and lungs in one patient. And I'd say this is one of the few causes. Uh, there are multiple, of course, uh, different, uh, different uh, genotypes. MM is normal. ZZ is the worst, which I should probably put here. The ZZ phenotype is by far the worst. Uh, and these patients have an increased risk of uh, liver cancer as well. There are occupational reasons for having COPD. And this is one of the major reasons that uh, I think China, India, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of countries which are rapidly developing now are going to in 20 or 30 years have a massive, massive problem. And I say this as someone who's been to the conferences and heard the data, the 20 and 30 year olds right now in New Delhi, Mumbai, Beijing, uh, in major cities, which are very developed with lots of factories nearby uh, and with huge numbers of cars on the street, they have these these people in their twenties and thirties don't realize it, but the amount of smoke and uh, tar exposure that they're being exposed to is absolutely dramatic. I mean, the the amount of uh, smoke in the air in New Delhi at rush hour is like seven hundred and fifty times above what would be considered safe. Uh, it's crazy. Like basically, there there is no way that you're not going to have a massive, absolutely massive incidence of COPD. Uh, and they have actually seen huge numbers of asthma, way more than you would expect. Uh, they're going to have a huge problem with COPD in about 20 or 30 years time. Yeah, and it's going to be a huge deal. So while this has kind of died out in the West, because we just don't mine that much coal anymore, uh, and uh, it's beginning to die out here, it's going to be a huge problem in about a couple of decades in the, in the more rapidly developing countries right now. Click, click, click. Okay, there we go. So how do you, make, how do you talk about COPD in a clinical history station. There are two aspects to it, right? You can make a diagnosis of COPD on the history, kind of. You do need to do an FEV1, but the history can be very suggestive. So in a smoker, and I do think it has to be a smoker or some other exposure to something that is plausible, like, uh, like coal tar or cadmium or something, uh, then a productive cough for three months of the year for two consecutive years is one of the key things in the history which will tell you this patient has chronic bronchitis. Okay, and that's a key little that those numbers are important. It's been in the uh, it's been in the diagnostic criteria for absolutely ages, and it's very very important uh, that you remember. It's one of the things that I would expect medical students to know uh, who are trying to be impressive. 
Emphysema is a histological diagnosis. It's permanent airspace dilatation. So you can only really diagnose it with um, technically by sending a little biopsy to histology. You can get some signs on um, chest X-ray and CT scanning, of course, but technically it's a histological diagnosis. Uh, the FEV1 to FVC ratio being less than 70% is pretty diagnostic. And so FEV1 under 80% is, uh, is suggested. That ratio is effectively telling you this patient has an obstructive defect. It's a very sensitive marker for an obstructive defect. So in a smoker with that kind of history uh, and sign of an, a ratio of less than 70%, that would be diagnostic of COPD. You should do spirometry or offer to do spirometry. Uh, you should do, and if you're being really clever and trying to really impress to show them, uh, yeah, I've been on a respiratory ward round, you will say, I would like to do spirometry with bronchodilator response. And that's because that will help differentiate it from late onset asthma. Uh, so uh, asthma, of course, you're looking for something like above 20% uh, improvement uh, or a 20% diurnal improvement. You can keep a diary if you really want, but an FEV1 to FVC ratio of less than 0.7, which is not fully reversible, is very suggestive. An arterial blood gas is, an, is a useful investigation to have, particularly in, to be honest, I think it's useful in almost any respiratory case, and certainly it's mandated in any patient who's breathless at rest. Like, why would you not want to check their oxygen CO2 balance uh, and in anyone who's breathless? I think it's absolutely essential. If a patient looks breathless to you, they should get an arterial gas because you want to see what their gas exchange looks like. That's it. That's kind of the whole doctor thing that we're going for here. Uh, a chest x-ray is mandated as long as you can justify it. So if someone who's breathless at rest should get a chest x-ray if they haven't had a recent one, because there you are actually looking for diagnostic reasons, right? You can say, why are you looking at the chest x-ray? You say, well, the patient appears to be breathless at rest. I'd like to exclude a causes of breathlessness, which could include, and then you can give me a whole list. You can say, I'm looking for focal consolidation. You can say, I'm looking for pleural effusions. You can say, I'm looking for an isolated pneumothorax. And if this is indeed chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, I'm looking for signs of hyperinflation, flattening of the diaphragms, bully, prominent pulmonary arteries, which would be a, a kind of a modest, modest sign of pulmonary hypertension. And if you're really worried about right heart failure, big JVP, big peripheral edema, then the patient should have an echo to look at the pulmonary pressures and actually quantify the pulmonary hypertension. Now, this is an example of an X-ray, uh, which I hope is fine for me to take because I just Googled it and it was the first one there. Uh, so I think this is open source. Uh, of a nondescript patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. What you're looking at here is a classic chest x-ray for hyperexpansion. It's absolutely, I mean, I can tell you, you should be able to look at this kind of, you know, on someone's phone, like down the street and be like, yeah, that's hyperexpanded chest right there. Because you can see, besides the fact that, well, it looks pretty damn hyperexpanded, this is huge. Uh, the diaphragm is pretty flattened out. The heart is way thinner than you would expect on this. And that's because the lung volumes are so large. Uh, you're looking at flattening of the hemidiaphragm. Uh, you're looking at the fact that, uh, that you can see the diaphragm below the anterior end of the seventh rib, which is really, you know, there's a lot of ribs you can see here. This is a very classic hyperexpanded chest x-ray. I would suggest you make this diagnosis on a, uh, how do I erase this thing now? Uh, on a, there we go on a patient who's had a PA film. I hope this projects well, because between AP and PA, there's a massive difference. This is the same patient. This is the exact same patient, one minute apart. This is, sorry, this is an AP film and this is a PA film. And that's the difference between them. So make this diagnosis on a PA film because it's just better for looking at the lung, uh, the lung parenchyma. And you can see with AP, everything can just look a lot worse. Yeah, and the penetration is very, very poor. So suggest that you try and do this on a PA film, not an AP film. Sorry guys, I know I'm not a radiologist, so I don't wanna to get too much into chest x-rays here. We should do a chest x-ray session at some point. That would be pretty cool. I have a really nice chest x-ray talk. Uh, okay. So treatment, how do you treat your patient with COPD? Well, you can tell them to stop smoking. That's kind of useful. Uh, if you're with a respiratory consultant, they will love you for saying the next thing, get a flu and pneumococcal vaccine. And to be honest, in the guidelines, it's one of the first things they say is improve lifestyle and make sure they have the flu and pneumococcal vaccine. Uh, because you're trying, these are the things that'll kill them. Getting flu is not great if you've got bad lungs, you have very poor respiratory reserve. Uh, and pneumococcus, well, that's one of the commoner causes of, of pneumonia, right? Strep pneumonia. So having that vaccine makes a lot of sense. 
You can consider bronchodilators and inhaled steroids. Uh, and that is a very kind of, th those. that's a global statement that can, you can get into. They'll say, well, well, give me the kind of guidelines on that. And you can get right into it, into salbutamol, long-acting beta agonists, all that kind of stuff. But you can, as a blanket statement, say treatment pharmacologically includes bronchodilators and inhaled steroids. Completely reasonable. Uh, mucolytics, like carbocysteine. Now, this is, this is where we get into a little, uh, it's not controversy. It's not as bad as controversy. Okay. Most registrars have been noticing, have been using carbocysteine. Most respiratory doctors have been using carbocysteine as a mucolytic to, especially in patients with frequent exacerbations and difficult to cough up butum. What it does is it thins out your mucus secretions and makes it easy to cough up. However, until recently, there has not been very good evidence that this actually makes any difference. It doesn't hurt. And there's been lots of anecdotal evidence. Like I, when I see patients in clinic, when I used to do respiratory, uh, which I did as a reg for a little while. Uh, I used to notice that patients on carbocysteine did genuinely come back and say, you know, coughing is easier, breathing is easier, I don't have as many exacerbations. And actually there is now reasonable evidence that patients with uh, mucolytics have fewer exacerbations. That hasn't filtered down to the UK guidelines to be a thing where like, yeah, every patient should get this. Um, but in the European guidelines, it is there. So actually I think this is going to be entering the guidelines here soon and universally because the evidence is pretty compelling that exacerbations do decrease on uh, mucolytics. Surgery, lung volume reduction surgery is an option and that's for really, really severe uh, COPD. Uh, and what you're trying to do there is get rid of some dead space and reduce that air trapping to improve your ventilation. So if your lungs are constantly massively full and you can't empty them, you can surgically bring them right down so that all that muscle movement actually gets some efficient ventilation and shifting more air, right? You're improving your, um, your ventilation perfusion mismatch. And this is something, of course, every medical student needs to know about, which is long-term oxygen therapy. Long-term oxygen therapy uh, is to be considered in any patient who has a PaO2 of less than 7.3 twice. And this is any stable patient. There's no point doing this in patients with, uh, who are in hospital with an exacerbation with a really low pH because they're unwell. In stable patients who are not exacerbated at the time, if you, the, you measure their PaO2, and I'm using the UK, uh, I'm using the UK, uh, uh, what's it called? The, the UK reference ranges here, of course, uh, the, because this is PaO2 uh, with, in, um, in kilopascals. Uh, then, yeah, exactly, Alexander. So it's 55 millimeters of mercury in Roman Catholic. But a, a PaO2 of 7.3 on kind of the UK units that we use. Uh, in, uh, I think it's pascals or something, isn't it? Kilopascals? I can't remember. I never checked that. So a PO2 of less than 7.3 done twice, at least three weeks apart in stable patients mandates long-term oxygen therapy. And long-term oxygen therapy is defined as 15 hours a day. Yeah. So it's no good just being having your nasal cannula on for like six hours during the day. It needs to be 15 hours a day for it to be considered long-term oxygen therapy. And that's kind of difficult, actually. You need to get the patients to really, it's a lifestyle thing. It'll really change. 15 hours a day is not easy. So you'll have to keep the nasal cannula in all the time. And you get all these issues with a patient's finding that actually with the nasal cannula, they get these little friction kind of damage to the inside of their nostrils, all this kind of thing. Uh, Long-term oxygen therapy can also be considered in anyone who has pulmonary hypertension and by that, I mean core pulmonale, right? Uh, or secondary polycythemia. These are basically end organ damage next to, uh, or secondary to respiratory failure. In that case, the PAO2 needs to be less than eight with any of these secondary criteria. So if, it's, if their PAO2 is less than 7.3, regardless of what else is going on, and they're stable and you've done it twice, then they should get LTOT. If their PAO2 is less than eight, but they have these other secondary signs that their end organs are not happy with the degree of hypoxia they have, such as their bone marrow just chunking out lots of erythropoietin, then they should also have LTOT. And nutritional support. Part of the issue with having right heart failure or slowly rising right heart pressures is that your IVC is congested. And if your IVC is congested, then the stomach lining, which is drained by the IVC is also congested. So your stomach lining is kind of always congested with fluid. And what that means is your stomach wall is slightly distended all the time, so you lose your appetite, which means you you're an unwell patient with right heart failure with no appetite, so you start losing protein. And because of that, you start losing muscle mass. Now, if you're relying on your respiratory muscles to breathe, losing muscle mass is probably not an ideal uh, strategy. So actually, 
one of the consequences of this is you get into this uh, and now I get I got to be honest with you as a cardiologist everything comes down to cardiology to me so I apologize if I keep going in the circle because everything in my mind comes down to the heart eventually it's some some one way or the other it'll all end up back at the heart so part of the issue is they'll get this cardiac cachexia which is a complication of congestive or right heart failure because their stomach lining is so congested with the fluid so they will start losing they'll get cachectic eventually if it's really severe and that means they need nutritional support. And that could be giving them a high calorie diet, protein. They'll need to go to a nutritionist and kind of a dietitian, sorry, to figure out exactly uh, what they need to actually maintain because they'll start having nutritional deficiencies at that point, which is a real pain. COPD severity, at least in the UK, and to be honest, most of Europe uh, is measured based on the European Society of Car uh, sorry, I was going to say European Society of Cardiology, European Respiratory Society criteria, and they use the gold classification. Uh, so it's entirely dependent on your FEV1. Your FEV1 determines how severe it is. Uh, so these are kind of objective markers. If your FEV1 is above 80%, it's mild. 50 to 80 is moderate. 30 to 50 is severe. And less than 30 is very severe. I personally find, guys, tables like this, which, by the way, you can Google. You don't need to take a photo of this. You can just Google gold staging COPD, right? I don't find tables like this helpful to learn early in your uh, final year. This is more useful for you. I mean, I'd make like a PowerPoint with like 20 of these and kind of halfway through this final year, start having it so it's in the back of your mind. I would fill your head right now with how do I present the major signs this is not going to be a pass fail thing. If you miss this in the exam, you can still get a prize. I mean, I really don't think this is the most impressive thing a candidate can tell me. This just means they've been looking at lists. This doesn't tell me you're a good doctor because anyone with a phone and Google can tell me this. So I don't need uh, this from a medical student. I need a medical student to explain to me other stuff, which, uh, which you can't Google so easily. So I would suggest make a list of it, have a look at near the exams, but don't actually spend you know, ages learning this stuff because there's more useful things you can be learning. Uh, you can quantify the breathlessness as well. I have to say, you really don't need to know this in this level of detail. The reason I thought this might be worth including is number one, for completeness. And number two, because actually the MRC dyspnea scale is very, very, very similar to the New York Heart Association uh, scale for breathlessness for heart failure. Like basically it's one to five and the higher the number, the more the worse your breathlessness is on exertion. It's very similar to NYHA criteria, right? NYHA one, two, three, and four. This one goes from one to five, and it's a similar kind of thing. Basically one being not breathless at all and five being too breathless to even get out of bed kind of thing. So, I mean, the way to, the, to if I had to learn this for finals, the way I would personally do it, and this is just my own tip and trick, is I would learn, I mean, basically I'm expecting the examiner to say, how would you quantify their breathlessness or are there any scales you're aware of? And I'd say, yes, we can use the MRC dyspnea scale which goes from one to five, one being no symptoms and five being extremely severe breathlessness. I'm not expecting them to say, what's MRC three? I don't think they're gonna say that. As long as I can put it all together into one sentence, I don't actually need to know what one, two, three, four, and five actually are. I just need to know that one is the least, five is the worst, and it's called the MRC dyspnea scale. That's how I would quantify that so I can kind of deliver it in an OSCE. And that way I hopefully haven't expunged too much space in my memory for more useful things. Okay, how do you manage your COPD? Well, um, you start with salbutamol, right? You can start with beta agonist, but fundamentally once it gets worse uh, and their FEV1 is kind of lower than that or they're getting more symptoms, you move on to long-acting beta agonist or long-acting uh, muscarinic uh, antagonist. And to be honest, more recently, we have uh, now got data that LAMAs are better than LABAs. So actually this is probably preferred. Uh, I'm not sure if that's in the criteria yet. Currently, they say do use either, uh, so whichever works. But I have to say, more recent, uh, more recent info suggests that LAMAs are slightly better uh, at symptom control. So we are beginning to prefer that. Of course, once it gets bad enough, we kind of chuck it all in. We go with combination therapy, LABA, LAMA, inhaled corticosteroid. So triple therapy does work as well. One of the things we like using, at least in clinical practice, is combination therapy. So if you get at least a couple of exacerbations a year and your FEV1 is less than 50%, then you can use one of these combination inhalers. And uh, these combination inhalers are really useful because, well, it's less inhalers for the patient to carry. So they just have one, uh, which combines both. And they use serotide or Symbicort. Uh, and then there is a third one, which is a combination, which I haven't put on here. Does anyone know the name? I'm sure you'll have run into it. It's the cheapest one. Trimbo? Trimbo, if someone is saying. I have to say, I haven't run across Trimbo. It might be a new trade name. You might be right. Uh, I'm sure you are. Uh, I haven't run into that. I was thinking Foster. 
Foster. At least that was the one I was using about three or four years ago when I was doing respiratory. So maybe they've moved on. Uh, but Foster, Trimbo, I presume, Barrow Dual, not heard of that either. You got to remember, uh, these are very, I'm a very UK centric just because of my, uh, my, where I'm practicing. So I'm very London centric, if not UK centric. So of course, trade names change around depending on the company and depending on where you are. Trilogy, again, not heard of any of these. I'm sure they're real. <laughs> I've just not been exposed to it personally. I see a lot of serotide at work. I see a lot of Foster as well. Uh, might just be that our local authority has a good deal to get those drugs. Uh, but they all include inhaled corticosteroid and uh, inhaled long-acting beta agonist. And uh, we, we tell patients to use them uh, as a reliever because what they effectively do is the more breathless you get, you use it more and more, and you're effectively tapering up your corticosteroid dose. And then as things get better, you use it less, you're tapering down. You get this natural tapering effect of the steroid, which is quite beautiful. Um, of course, once it gets more severe, home nebulizers, theophylines can be considered. Uh, they are falling a bit out of favor, but they do work um, in some patients and uh, anti-mucolytics, as I mentioned. Yeah. So newer therapies that have come onto the, uh, onto the four more recently, roflumilast is one of them. It's a phosphodiesterase four inhibitor, and it is a bronchodilator. This is for stable COPD, it's not for acute exacerbations. And it can be considered in moderate or really more than moderate. It's people who have moderate to severe, but with lots of exacerbations. And it's been shown to reduce uh, exacerbation frequency. Okay, mucolytics we already talked about. Macrolides. There is n this is now in the uh, in the guidelines. Azithromycin can be considered uh, long term azithromycin, specifically uh, as the macrolide can be considered in patients uh, to reduce exacerbation frequency if they have severe COPD. And it is in the guideline for the UK and Europe. Uh, so so the thing here is azithromycin was around. I believe it was first used for bronchiectasis. Actually, it was around for a little while. And it's been known to have some, not immunosuppressive, but immunomodulatory effects, which may, and I'm, yeah, I'm being hesitant because I haven't seen the data, uh, the, the PubMed data myself firsthand. I think uh, it's been shown to reduce exacerbations by having this immunomodulatory effect on the endothelium. And it does, besides the fact that it kills bacteria, it does have that added effect and it can reduce exacerbation frequency. And of course, you need to be prepared for this question. How do you manage an acute exacerbation? Um, whenever an examiner asks you any question, try and um, think of it like writing an essay. You're gonna try and just organize your thoughts into kind of big bullet points. You wanna manage the respiratory failure, you wanna manage the infection, and you wanna consider chronic management. So those are the three things you need to take off. From the respiratory failure side, you begin with controlled oxygen therapy. And the reason you do controlled oxygen therapy is the fact that Patients with advanced COPD, of course, not early COPD, advanced COPD may be, not always, but may be chronically hypoxic. And if they are chronically hypoxic, then they are relying on being chronically hypoxic to keep their respiratory rate up. The way medical students are always taught this is they are relying on hypoxia. It's a hypoxia-driven um, respiratory drive. What that means is you and me are used to being at 99, 98% all the time. We dropped to 95, 94, 93 we'll start getting a little more breathless to increase that. These patients are at 88, 89, 90 all the time. So actually they're kind of used to it. And if you make them go to 95%, then actually they're thinking, oh, I've got way too much oxygen in my blood. I'll just breathe a bit less. And you're taking away their respiratory drive. So therefore you give controlled oxygen therapy aiming for saturations of 88 to 92. And I should point out that should be only in patients who are, uh, who are, chronically hypoxic. Now, one way as a registrar, you can tell that is by just doing a gas. If their bicarbonate is high, then this patient probably does have chronic hypoxia uh, and CO2 retention, and that's why they have some metabolic compensation. Uh, if, however, they don't have any of that, there's no good evidence that this patient is chronically hypoxic. Now, I don't think 88 to 92 is going to kill anyone, but um, in anyone who's really seriously unwell, like if the patient's blue and dying in front of you, there's no point giving them two liters of nasal cannula and seeing what's happening. Uh, in the beginning, it would be reasonable to just pump on 100% oxygen, give it two minutes and see what your SATs are. In an emergency, you should always just give 100% oxygen, basically, is my point. Controlled oxygen is when you think you have a couple of minutes and you're not just going to prescribe it, walk away and come back in three hours. So there's a little bit of pragmatism here, okay? 
type two respiratory failure, anyone with type two respiratory failure. Now the book actually says PA, oh, sorry, PAG, PAO2 of less than eight or PACO2 of greater than six. Uh, actually the proper guideline uh, is 6.5. Uh, PACO2, so CO2, basically a high CO2, type 2 respiratory failure, you should be considering non-invasive ventilation or BiPAP. Now, the, the even more impressive answer is they should be considered for, uh, for non-invasive ventilation within one hour of coming into hospital if they, have been, uh, if they have been refractory to standard medical management. So they come in to A&E, to the emergency department with a COPD exacerbation. You are allowed for one hour to try nebulize salbutamol, nebulize it protropium, steroids. You try to try all that. And if within 60 minutes you haven't improved their gas, then you should be considering NIV. Doesn't mean they come in, do the first gas. Okay, he goes on to NIV straight away. Of course, it kind of depends. If the CO2 is nine, I don't think that's gonna improve. So I think in that situation, I probably would just stick them on NIV. There's a little bit of, again, pragmatism. This is again, frontline kind of, you see it and then use your clinical judgment. But you are technically, based on guideline, allowed to give it an hour, yeah, uh, and see if in one hour standard therapies improve things. And if they do, you can avoid the NIV if the second gas is better. If they haven't improved it, then they should go straight on to NIV within one hour. And that would be by by level uh, positive airway pressure, so BiPAP. All patients with an acute exacerbation must have steroids and antibiotics. There was some controversy about antibiotics. It's like, well, like 50, 60% of exacerbations, at least in some areas, are viral and not bacterial. But actually, we now know that they can have a secondary infection uh, while they're having an exacerbation. They'll just aspirate or something. So we now know antibiotics are generally a good thing, and they are in the guidelines. So you should consider steroids and antibiotics. If the patient can swallow, you can give it to them orally. 30 milligrams prednisolone is the reasonable dose. Uh, and is in the guideline, you should consider a steroid dose orally for up to two weeks, 30 milligrams once a day. If it's an emergency, the patient can't swallow, they're too breathless to swallow, giving them 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone is a, probably a very reasonable shout until such time as they can take their pills. So IV hydrocortisone is what I would use uh, and I do use in these patients and that does work. So, which brings us nicely onto NIV. What is NIV? Um, okay, I need I need probably a volunteer here. Um, someone who doesn't mind volunteering, can you unmute yourself? I just need I don't need your uh, video. I just need audio. Just one person. In fact, shall I pick one? There's 112 people here, so shall I just pick one? Uh, God, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Who do I pick? Uh, message me. Message me if you don't mind being picked, and I'll pick you if that's okay. I just need you to turn off your microphone for like five seconds to demonstrate something. It, can anyone hear me? Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> All right, perfect. Someone's there. I just realized I may have been talking to, to myself this whole time. Alexander Hossein, thank you so much for yeah. stepping up. Here's what I want you to do, Alexander. Just uh, do this favor for me, yeah? I want you to sigh for me. Just go. <sighs> yeah, right, you sighed. Excellent. Now, uh, I want you to try and do the same thing, but I want you to... Uh, perk, I was going to say, just uh, just pout your lips as if you're uh, you're blowing a kiss, but really small, or blowing a whistle, really really small. And now try and get that same volume of air as goes, blowing through really perked lips. I'm doing it. I don't know if you can hear it, but I'm doing Fantastic. it. Fantastic. I'm going to mute you now. I, I I I've never done that before. Hope it worked. All right. Here's the point I'm making. All of you at home can try this. Yeah. If I ask you to take a deep breath in and breathe all the way out, you just go, <sighs> right? There's no obstructive defect there. But if I asked you to now pout your lips, yeah, like, uh, like you're just, um, like you're trying to blow a whistle or something, really, really small, make the hole really small, per slip breathing, you might even say, and try and breathe hard and fast out of that through really tight lips, you'd go, <sighs> it takes longer to breathe out, yeah? And the reason it's taking longer to breathe out is you've got an obstructive defect that you've created in front of your mouth, which pursed lip breathing. So you're now thinking, well, hang on, why am I giving myself an obstructive defect and how does that help? Well, when you're doing that, as I'm saying this, try it again. What are you feeling in your stomach as you're trying to breathe out against that force? You should be feeling a pressure in your lower abdomen and your diaphragm of pushing against something. Yeah, as you're trying to force air out, you can actually feel that pressure in your chest and stomach as you're blowing against a pressure. 
what that is doing is splinting open your collapsible airway passages lower down. Now in you and me, that probably doesn't matter because we don't have many collapsible airway passages. But if your fundamental problem is that you have inefficient ventilation because you have these collapsible passages and emphysema and all this kind of crap, then the reason you're having the obstructive defect all the time is that you are actually, that wheeze you're hearing is the collapsing of the airways uh, distally. And that means these guys are air trapping. If you breathe against a pressure and you splint open your collapsible airways, you are going to improve your tidal volume and you're gonna keep those air passages open and you are gonna have more efficient ventilation. That's how why NIV works. Does that make sense? That's non-invasive ventilation. All NIV is doing is you are artificially giving them purslet breathing all the time and actually control, you have, a, you have a little dial to actually say, right, how much pressure do I want with this? As opposed to the patient just doing purslet breathing. Purslet breathing is the patient using NIV on themselves. That's them doing it to themselves. And if you watch purslet breathing, that is NIV. That is actually what NIV is. You're breathing against a pressure to try and keep your distal passages open and have more efficient ventilation. Does that make sense? I've been thinking so hard over the years, how do I explain this well? without getting like really stuck into tidal volumes and then people's eyes glaze over and blah, blah, blah. I hope this makes sense. It's really, really kind of obvious when you think about it, uh, because as you're breathing, you should be able to feel it in your stomach that you're breathing against this pressure. Okay, uh, fine. Oh, and it has many, many benefits. One of them is improving your tidal volume. It re reduces your work of breathing because you're also getting this support when you're breathing in again with pressure. So actually you're expanding your chest with a little less muscular work. It improves your gas exchange by doing all that to an examiner, to a respiratory medic, uh, you will make them putty in your hands by saying the phrase, it reduces the ventilation perfusion mismatch. Just learn that for finals and you'll be impressive. That is what you're doing, but that's the kind of, it's like telling a, it's like telling a cardiologist uh, the right way to present a murmur as opposed to, oh yeah, it's systolic and blah, blah, blah. If you just say, well, it's an injection systolic murmur of at least grade four severity heard best in the aortic valve. Like, like, it just makes me much more impressed. So this will impress a respiratory physician. It reduces the ventilation perfusion mismatch. Learn the phrase and you uh, use it sparingly. Okay, that's great. And now I'm thinking this, this candidate is excellent. They have clearly, you know, they know what they're doing or Ritesh has taught them. So that's great. Let me push them a little bit. When must you not use NIV? And there are some certain situations when NIV must definitely not be used. One of them, uh, and this is a really classic one for SBAs, uh, but because I had so much to cover, I haven't put SBAs in today's talk. I just, just thought we would overrun quite significantly. Um, one of them, and this is really classic because I've written SBAs like this, is facial trauma or burns. So any patient who's got, you know, kind of, of uh, you can't put a tight face ear fitting mask on someone who's got facial burns or facial trauma. It just wouldn't, wouldn't work. It would be dangerous. Uh, and the other things you can say is reduce GCS. So if, you're, uh, if your GCS is less than eight, you're heading towards a coma, a GCS less than eight is a contraindication. I, gray area, because if the patient is not for, uh, not for recess, not for intubation and ventilation, in that situation, you could almost use it. Uh, you know, not in a completely comatose patient, but with reduced GCS, there, you, there are gray areas there. So you'd run it by your boss. Generally speaking, a low GCS is a contraindication. There have been some studies showing actually, even with an eight-ish or slightly lower GCS, patients do okay, and it's not dangerous. So there are, there's a gray area there, which, you know, we can be, we can kind of balance it depending on the clinical situation. Patients with asthma or pneumonia with acidosis, this is not the treatment. And I, and I cannot emphasize this enough. One of, my, one of my most horrible memories as a junior doctor, right after graduation, was a patient with, um, pretty young patient actually, not, very, not much older than myself at the time, uh, and younger than I am now, I'm 35. This guy had come in with pneumonia and, uh, and, uh, uh, and basically he had a focal consolidation of his chest secretion. He, he had a bronchopneumonia, like a you know, bog standard bronchopneumonia, just unlucky. So he had a bronchopneumonia and uh, he was uh, in the wards and he was, uh, you know, we did a gas because he was very breathless and he was acidotic with CO2 retention and unwell. And, you know, you know, temperature 39 on IV antibiotics, just, just sick, looked really sick, really bad uh, kind of bacterial pneumonia. And uh, unfortunately he was trialed on NIV and he died. And it turned out, we did this whole kind of thing where it turned out later on, that it is actually, it's buried deep in the guidelines. This, we, we had no, uh, there was, he was also terminally unwell with other things. He had actually had lymphoma and other things. So in a way, it was a terrible story, unfortunately. And he, he was uh, intensive care. 
And actually, this chap was not for intensive care, therefore we had tried NIV. But actually, in that situation, had he been for intensive care, this is not someone you would ever put on NIV. It's an absolute contraindication. The thing I've nicked here, this screenshot, is from the uh, guideline for NIV. NIV is not indicated in asthma or pneumonia uh, in patients with acidosis. In those patients, you send them for intubation and ventilation onto intensive care. These are not patients you put on NIV in a side room and kind of leave it till the morning. This is a really, really dangerous situation. COPD, yes, uh, but NIV must not be used in these patients if they're acidotic. It's really, really dangerous. There, uh, some people think pneumothorax is a contraindication. Of course, you have to be a little bit more careful. If you have a pneumothorax, um, then of course you can make that into a tension, not always, but you can make that into a tension pneumothorax with, um, with NIV. Uh, ideally, you should drain the pneumothorax first. Uh, it might be a chronic pneumothorax in, case, uh, in which case you're probably okay. Uh, but in those situations, you should always obviously be running this by a senior doctor to make sure. Uh, what is the one thing I want you to do in every patient where you are considering NIV? It's not a trick question. Every patient who is being considered for NIV must have an up-to-date chest x-ray. They absolutely must because you're looking for pneumothorax, you're looking for focal consolidation, you're looking for all that stuff. So this is more practical stuff. Like you're seeing a COPD patient on the respiratory ward 2 a.m. He's getting a bit more breathless and you're thinking, hmm, he's getting worse. The gas doesn't look great. I'm going to call the registrar for advice. But you as a junior doctor can be that little bit better and think, you know what, if we, uh, the boss is going to think he might need an IV, so he needs an up-to-date chest x-ray. So if his chest x-ray is more than a couple of days old, it's worth getting an up-to-date chest x-ray. Because a new deterioration, we don't know if he's got a pneumothorax. A bolus could have you know, puffed and he's now got a small pneumothorax. So you need to make the diagnosis. You need to look for focal consolidation. You need to do all that. So before you make the phone call to the registrar, really useful to get a bedside chest x-ray and a fresh one. And that's kind of... Again, that stuff you'll only pick up once you're actually on the wards. All right, once you start NIV, here's what you're aiming for. You are aiming for tidal volumes of five mils per kilogram. It's actually four to six, but I think five, you can just remember that easier. Um, so five mils per kilogram is a reasonable target. So in a 60 kilogram man, it's 300 mils. And actually every NIV machine will tell you tidal volume or VT, uh, you know, tidal volume will be written there on the machine. It'll calculate it for you. And it'll tell you basically how much volume of air is this patient shifting with each breath. And this is where the whole benefit of NIV is that you're improving their tidal volumes. You're aiming for five mils per kilogram. If you go higher than that, there is a risk of barotrauma in the um, alveoli. So you don't want to, you don't want to over egg the pudding, as my boss says. Uh, you know, you don't want to go crazy here. Five mils per kilogram, don't go above that. If it's less than that, then your NIV is basically not doing its job. So you should be changing the pressures and fiddling with them to aim for five mils per kilogram. Uh, and there are ways to do that. You can, uh, generally speaking, if your uh, tidal volume is low, this is very, very basic because generally you will not be touching these controls. It'll be the SHO or ideally the registrar will be messing with NIV controls. You can increase the IPAP, which is the inspiratory pressure. And that will generally as a very basic rule, increase your tidal volumes. You want the difference between the big number and the small number to be slightly bigger, to have bigger tidal volumes, uh, and that generally works. Uh, as a rule of thumb, if you start someone on NIV, they, uh, they should have a repeat gas at 15 minutes to see if it's working, then at one hour, then at four to six hours, and then every day while they're on NIV. That's the general rule of thumb. That's if things are working if things are going the right direction. If the gases are looking bad, then they should be every 15 minutes until you start going in the right direction. I, this is a practical thing. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of patients in my time on NIV and it is kind of mean to keep going for the radial artery and it hurts like hell. So I think it's kind of reasonable to give the patient subcutaneously one or two mils of lignocaine with an orange needle. I really believe it is. I mean, it's, that needle is much smaller than an ABG needle. I know people say, oh, we're using a needle twice, but actually it gives them like four to six hours of pain relief and they won't feel the next couple of gases. I think it's just more kind. And it takes you three seconds and you're a doctor, just take an orange needle and give them one mil of subcutaneous lignocaine over the radial artery, rub it so that the kind of you know, little bleb disappears. And then you can, you can have a gas with a patient not screaming and uncomfortable. And they're already kind of having respiratory failure, I mean, you might as well make them comfortable. So I think that's just a reasonable thing to do. And I think as a practical matter, every patient that I deal with in IV gets a bit of lignocaine on their wrist because it just, it seems perverse to me that we wouldn't consider it. It's such a simple intervention to make them comfortable.
Okay, anyway, that's just my little ho hobby horse, excuse me. Uh, auction in general. I'm gonna finish with literally two or three slides on auction. What's the time like? It's 10 o'clock. I do apologize, I knew I'd overrun. So I'm going to do a couple of slides and I'm gonna go through all the chat questions. I hope this has been okay. Sorry, the coffee's kicking in. I know I'm speaking fast. Okay. This is more generically for oxygen, not just COPD. You should give oxygen to target enough to adequately oxygenate the end organ systems and tissues. So in you and me and kind of people without chronic respiratory failure, you want SATs of above 94%. You want lower end COPD for reasons we've explained because they're relying on the hypoxic drive. But the same is true in patients with interstitial lung disease. The same is true in patients with neuromuscular disease who are, who are chronically at 88 to 92. The same may be true in obesity hypoventilation syndrome and things like that. So in any, any case where the patient is kind of walking around doing everyday activities at 88 to 92, if you put them at 95% artificially, they will then get CO2 narcosis because they will reduce their, you will lose the respiratory drive. So to give more oxygen, it's pretty simple. You increase the fraction of inspired oxygen, that's it. So if I give you, instead of 21% in the air, if I give you 60%, you have more inspired oxygen, so your oxygen levels should rise. And I know that sounds really basic. Uh, you can give oxygen in multiple ways. You can give nasal oxygen up to four liters. You can't go above that on nasal. Uh, you can give a mask with non-rebreather, which is kind of your ideal situation for emergencies. I would use a mask with non-rebreather uh, valve. A venturi is for controlled oxygenation, and you can use ventilation, non-invasive or invasive. The thing is, yeah, if I said to you, you're giving someone six liters of oxygen, and I said, what is the FiO2 of that? And what percentage oxygen is that? Most people don't know that off the top of their head. These are rough estimates. I Google this, so you can nick this from the Google yourself if you want. But generally speaking, and these are not perfect, there is actually a fairly complex equation behind this. Generally speaking, you can approximate. So giving one liter of nasal oxygen is roughly equivalent to giving 24%. Giving five liters is 40%. And giving 10 liters is 60%. Okay, those are rough numbers. And it's important to know this because we go from saying, okay, Venturi must 60%, to oh, give them four liters via nasal. You need to be able to translate those two between each other. So it is important to know that these can be related to each other, yeah? So just to be aware, you can convert one to the other. Oh, crap, how do I get rid of this now? Uh, one second. In a non, so the max you can give on the nasal is four liters, we said. In non-rebreather, you can go technically up to 100%. Yeah, and an emergency, that's the one you would go for. I'd use a face mask with non-rebreather because you can give 100% oxygen. Venturi is what should only be used in patients where you want to control the oxygen and be like, okay, I want to be precise. I don't just want to say, oh, it's like four liters. I can look with my eye. You use a Venturi valve and you're like, right, I'm giving this patient exactly 24 or exactly 28 or exactly 40. This is useful for precision. This is in patients where you need to be precise. Typically that's COPD. It could be any of those chronic respiratory conditions or neuromuscular conditions where patients are chronically hypoxic and you wanna give very precise, exact controlled oxygen. On a ventilation system like NIV or invasive ventilation intensive care, you can control that down to the exact percentage. You can say, right, I want 34%, you know, and you can actually select it exactly. And that's what you should do. And then there's this new thing called high flow nasal oxygen in the UK, at least where I, in the regions I work in, um, it's called Optiflow, which is probably a trade name. I'm sure it is. It sounds very cool. So it's like a trade name. Um, and that is uh, high flow nasal oxygen. And you will, have seen, you will have seen this a lot because it's been something we've been using to try and mitigate the use of non-invasive ventilation in patients with, um, with COVID and ARDS. So high flow nasal oxygen has come along. Uh, you know, it's, it was a small thing we were using and now it's massive and it's everywhere. Uh, and it's really, really helped with the COVID pandemic. And it's another way of delivering just a lot of oxygen and a little bit more flow. And it can, uh, you can choose relatively precisely how much oxygen you give from that. Oops, sorry. Um, how odd. Okay, that little hole detection meter. Anyway, come on, there we go. So ventilation can be non-invasive. We've talked about BiPAP already. Uh, CPAP is what we would use for heart failure, and that's called uh, that's continuous positive airway pressure, and that's basically for pulmonary edema and uh, left heart failure specifically. So we use I I run into that quite a lot, as you might imagine, heart attacks with pulmonary edema. We use this as an emergency all the time. Uh, the way you deliver non-invasive ventilation is with a full face mask. You can use a hood. There is also a nasal BiPAP or CPAP as well for patients who will happily breathe through the nose, and that can be used in, and is very very useful 
in patients who have obstructive sleep apnea. Invasive ventilation is generally done on intensive care. A surgeon will love this question. Um, invasive ventilation has to be done. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, just one moment, need a drink. Sorry about that. So invasive ventilation must be done via a definitive airway. And that's defined as a tube in the trachea with a cuff, yeah? That's a classic ENT surgical question. Uh, and it's something you must know, how do you define a definitive airway? A definitive airway is a tube in the trachea with a cuff, uh, such as an endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy. Therefore, a laryngeal mask airway, and this is more for your emergency station, some people who do have them, a laryngeal, an LMA doesn't technically count as a definitive airway. It is not a definitive airway. It's not in the trachea. It's a laryngeal mask airway, which is not a definitive airway. Uh, these are just some pictures. So, ah, oh, there we go. So this is the nasal CPAP or BiPAP. This is the hood. I have seen this in real life. Actually, patients love this because there's no tight fitting mask and stuff. It just, it is actually apparently a lot more comfortable. And uh, this face mask, I'm sure will be familiar to everyone. Uh, and that's it. Okay, wow, we managed it. And uh, let me just open up the chat. I'm gonna go through, there's some excellent questions. I think it's worth going through this. So, wow, 110 people on a Saturday morning. You guys are way more keen on medicine than I was at final year. Okay. That's, that's insane. All right. So uh, before, uh, before people start uh, logging out and disappearing and running off into the, into the afternoon, can I just suggest a couple of things? Number one, uh, this is really sad, but on Instagram, I am posting stuff. So if you, if you want to have a look at SBAs, they're on there. Uh, I hate giving a shout out to that, but uh, they're on there. I am still looking for people to join us. Um, if you have graduated and you are teaching and you're interested in something I'm not teaching, so then you know, I'm thinking specifically of pediatrics, which is something I'm struggling to find a pediatrician uh, to help me teach a bit of peds, uh, then do get in touch. Uh, you can find the link on my Instagram link, blah, 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 and fill in the Google form. And I'll be in touch once we see your cover letter and all that kind of stuff. Um, what else was I going to say? Yeah, there's a talk every week. Uh, we've got, uh, I've recruited a couple of psychiatrists to teach some psych for those of you who are doing psych. Uh, this year in exams. So uh, that should be pretty cool. I just think I have no credibility teaching anything other than medicine. Uh, so I kind of refuse to teach surgery, psych, pediatrics, obstetrics, because I, I, I'm just never trained that. So I can, I have medical school knowledge, but not like detailed knowledge, if that makes sense. Uh, next week is a surgical talk uh, by our resident surgeon. Uh, please do join that. Uh, it's all on my Facebook page. And let's go through the questions now. Okay, da da da, cardiac complications, you've done that. Percy breathing, you've done that. Pale, pale, pale. Okay, chest infection. Do they need consolidation on chest X-ray or is there a change in condition if the patient has consolidation as opposed to chest infection? Okay, it, consolidation on chest X-ray uh, is an important distinction to make because most exacerbations of COPD, the vast majority won't see consolidation on chest X-ray, you just won't. What they'll have is an infective exacerbation of COPD without any consolidation. If you have consolidation on a chest X-ray, then what you're saying is this is pneumonia. That's how I would define a pneumonia as opposed to a chest infection. Focal consolidation or chest x-ray is dangerous. It's really dangerous. Those patients have way higher mortality. That's where the CURB-65 score starts applying as well. CURB-65 is not applicable in patients without focal consolidation. So uh, you have to find that focal consolidation because it, if it's there, then uh, it's a much higher risk patient. And that's the reason for having it. Also, if they have focal consolidation, and they are needing NIV, then I would get intensive care down to discuss early because actually focal consolidation with NIV, the outcomes are relatively poor and there's a higher chance of failing. And those patients preferentially in most centers should be considered for intensive care unless there is a contraindication to intensive care. So this is an important thing to do. Every patient with, uh, with COPD, I mean, by definition, the A&E will have just done it for you. will get a chest x-ray anyway, so you'll be able to see it. Uh, is it concentric or eccentric RV hypertrophy? It is concentric because it's pulmonary hypertension. The whole right ventricle is involved and will be concentric. Although uh, I have to say eccentric RV hypertrophy is only ever seen in um, dysplastic uh, RV syndromes, which are very, very rare, like arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. That's a very rare thing. Uh, and it's associated with epsilon waves and things, but that's an MRCP question. So, uh, so I think that's probably extra. You don't need it. So it'll be concentric. The other stuff is all uh, inherited cardiomyopathy. So it's, it's going to be pretty rare, like arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Okay. Would it be possible to explain the difference between pathophysiology of pulmonary edema and pleural effusion? Yeah, sure. That's really, ah, oh, that's fun. Okay. 
let's do that. Uh, pathophysiology of pulmonary edema and pulmonary effusion. How do I do that now? I need, uh, it'd be nice to have an empty screen for me. Okay, can I draw here? Let me try drawing here. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. And actually someone may have explained, yeah, I think, uh, I think Asha here has put a nice explanation actually, but here very, very, very briefly between pulmonary edema and ugh, my drawings are so terrible. Okay. Okay. So why don't we start with pulmonary edema? So you've got pulmonary veins. This is the right side. This is the left side. I always draw as if the patient's sitting opposite me. I keep saying this. So this is what pulmonary edema is. If you've got left heart failure, yeah, your left ventricle is not happy and you've got extra blood here and your pulmonary veins are congested, then the pulmonary veins, which are draining the blood from all of your alveolar networks are also being, going to be congested, the capillaries, and therefore you get fluid inside the alveolus and that's pulmonary edema. That's what pulmonary edema is. So your fluid is inside the alveolus and you're effectively drowning from the inside out. It's kind of terrible actually, because uh, by some accounts, um, waterboarding was invented to simulate the, uh, the visual, like what they were seeing in patients with pulmonary edema. That's what waterboarding is supposed to simulate. Uh, and it was invented by torturers in Cambodia, apparently. Uh, one of them had seen his mum die of heart failure. And he was like, that's the most terrible thing I've seen. I need to replicate that for my political enemies. And that's apparently where it comes from. So it's actually, the, it's uh, apparently that's the history of it, um, which I hope hasn't traumatized everyone, but there we go. So right ventricle, um, pleural effusion. So if your right ventricle is failing, then shall I erase this actually? Oops. Great. One moment. Uh, let me try and clear some of this. Okay. So if this is your right ventricle and it's failing, then your IVC and SVC are congested with blood because the blood is not emptying from here. So your blood is not emptying from the right atrium. Therefore your IVC and SVC are full of blood. Okay. So if your IVC, uh, if your SVC is uh, full of blood, you can see the JVP is high, which is great. Um, but if your, uh, if your IVC and SVC are, are full of blood, the other thing is blood is not able to empty into the right atrium. And that blood ends up everywhere. So in the abdomen, that blood will just come out by oncotic pressure and become ascites. That blood, the, the IVC and SVC are also draining blood from around the lungs. So the base of the lungs are kind of here, right? And around the lungs, if the blood isn't draining, this is not oxygenated blood then you will get fluid collecting there just like ascites, like oncotic pressure, uh, and you will end up with fluid, uh, pleural effusion fluid, effectively, that's it. It's just a backlog of blood because you can't empty it into the right atrium. That's all it is. And that's the simplest kind of uh, explanation there is. Okay, fine. Da -da 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 -da. Heart transition inside of the edema. Sorry, my digestion. There's fluid within the institute, but that fusion is fluid in the pulmonary pulmonary edema, blah, blah, blah. Excellent, well done, guys. These are all good explanations. Would COPD have typically type two respiratory failure due to being hypoxic and CO2 retainers? Yes, yes, it would. Absolutely, they would. COPD patients typically have type two respiratory failure, which is both a low PaO2 and a high uh, PaCO2. Uh huh. And, and LTOD and ILD. Uh, are these the same criteria for LTOD and ILD? I'll have to look that up. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, I'll have to look that up. I know these are the COPD criteria. The thing is, LTOD criteria are different because the Physiology of LTOD for ILD is something completely different. Those patients are having LTOD uh, not because it's reducing frequency of exacerbation or whatever. It's actually because they're hypoxic all the time. So actually it's a different kind of thing. So I suspect the criteria must be different. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. What is the, uh, why is it dangerous to use NIV with a low GCS? Risk of aspiration is one of them, uh, at least the theoretical risk of aspiration. Uh, so actually there have been studies uh, now with GCS of seven finding actually the kind of outcomes are the same and the patients do all right. So actually you could argue. Um, why should you avoid NIV in someone with pneumonia, asthma with acidosis? What is the mechanism? I mean, if you're acidotic with pneumonia, then either you've got metabolic acidosis because you, you are just have a very severe pneumonia or you have respiratory acidosis. The theoretical thing is that NIV is blowing bacteria through diseased, um, alveoli directly into the bloodstream. Now you could argue that how is mechanical ventilation any safer? That's a reasonable thing to say. I think the thing with mechanical ventilation is that it's in intensive care. So the degree of medical care is, it's just way, way, way more, like it's on another level. NIV on the ward, even in an HDU is nowhere near as intensive or as 
kind of cautious and kind of you're monitoring the patient second to second pretty much as intensive care. And I think the thing is, if you are that sick with asthma or pneumonia, your mortality is pretty damn high if you have CO2 narcosis with acidosis. It really is. I mean, think about asthmatics and pneumonia. Uh, if you're getting that bad, then you, you, are, you are very high risk of death. Whereas if you have, um, if you have, and those patients should go to intensive care for the advanced medical care. And therefore I suspect the reason you're surviving in intensive care is the excellent one-to-one -one nursing and kind of all the advanced therapies you're exposed to, as opposed to the stuff on a ward, which are just another level. And that's probably the simplest explanation. I'm sure that is like 80% of it. Uh -huh. Can I explain the difference between CPAP and BiPAP and why when each is used? Yeah, sure. So CPAP, as uh, actually someone has put right after, BiPAP gives you two different pressures. There's expiratory pressure and inspiratory pressure, EPAP and IPAP. Um, and those two pressures create a difference, which allows you to breathe in and out uh, and have tidal volume. Whereas CPAP, you're blowing against the same pressure all the time, like 10 millimeters of mercury or whatever, you're blowing against that all the time, in and out. Now, in patients who have normal lung muscles and normal diaphragm, the, your ventilation is not the problem. It's not that you can't shift air in and out. It's just that you've got fluid inside the alveoli. To push that fluid back into the system, I need to create a pressure inside the alveoli that'll force the fluid back into the vasculature. And that is where CPAP comes into play. So blowing against the pressure all the time will, be, will, uh, will work. To be honest, BiPAP probably works as well. It's just the thing of, I don't need to give you support for ventilation because you have good enough muscles that an elastic recoil that you probably have enough tidal volume on your own. So, but BiPAP could work just as well, almost certainly. Regarding NIV, can you give it in an effective exclusive CBD? Yes, yes, that is exclusively where you must give it. Uh, if you have focal consolidation, then it's pneumonia with acidosis and COPD, and then it's a gray area. And in that situation, discuss with your registrar in intensive care. Uh, in practice, I'll say I'll tell you this: if the patient looks sick to me with a COPD exacerbation, focal consolidation, and acidosis, I will push bloody hard for that guy to go to intensive care. I really will, because I think that's a very dangerous combination. If the patient's not for intensive care, you know they've had multiple strokes, they've got terminal cancer and intensive care is inappropriate for them, then, I mean, you know, like it's a, it's a real clinical judgment call. And this is where book learning kind of goes out the window because not, not everything will fall into a nice algorithm for us. Sometimes it's just about looking at the patient and being like, okay, and you bring down your intensive care colleague and you make a sensible plan between yourselves. And sometimes you involve the patient's family or the patient if they're well enough to discuss it. And you say, you, and you have to put your hands up and say, we don't have an easy answer here. These are the two options. These are the bad sides of both options. I think on balance, this is better. What do you think? And that's kind of it. And that's, that's just, that's the kind of, that's being a doctor. That's just what we all have to go through. Uh, what's the difference between nebulizer and Venturi? Nebulizer is giving you medication. Venturi is just focused oxygen. Uh, so Venturi is just saying, right, I want a particular percentage of oxygen. It's not giving any medicines. I have a question. So if a patient is CPD, but the gas does not show bicarb rise, then should you target 88 to 92 or above 94? So I think if you have a COPD patient and they have no evidence of, um, uh, and they're, and, and sometimes patients with COPD who come into hospital or have an oxygen sat monitor at home, a lot of them do now, will tell you, yeah, doctor, I'm at 95% all the time. If he's telling you that and his gas doesn't show uh, hyper, uh, a high uh, bicarbonate level, then actually that patient, there is no reason for him to have 88 to 92. There really isn't. Being a good doctor is about not being so rigid about that. And you will be a more impressive doctor if you are focused on things like that, you know, real hard reasons for why are we doing 88 to 92? You should be able to question that. There's no reason giving a guy who's always at 95, 88 to 92, that makes no sense. Is there a feedback form? You know, I gotta say, I don't do feedback forms. I probably should, but after years of teaching, I kind of had loads of feedback. But why don't you do this? Would you tell me anything to improve um, as either a message on, you know what would be helpful is if you could go to my Facebook page for this event and or or to my Facebook page and give us a review um, uh, and <laughs> leave me any feedback there. I hope you're not trying to slate me. I just realized you might be asking because you're like, I want to tell him what an asshole he is. But if you aren't going to slag me off, please be gentle. Uh, but if you want to leave me some feedback, you'd be very welcome to leave it on my Facebook page. I'm hoping it's positive. If it's not, I can't stop that, but that's up to you. Okay, questions. Uh, is there high flow nasal cannula always humidified? No, I mean, there's no, yeah, I mean, in practice, yes, but you can take the humidification off, but why would you? High flow nasal oxygen should be humidified because otherwise it's incredibly uncomfortable. So is it always humidified? Uh, as in like, is it possible to find it unhumidified? I'm sure it is possible to find it. In practice, it's always humidified because it's incredibly uncomfortable uh, without humidification. Uh, 
if BiPAP is for tight respiratory failure, why does NICE recommend CPAP for OSA? Well, OSA is a different thing, right? Because with OSA, it's not a ventilation issue, yeah? BiPAP is not actually for type 2 respiratory failure. I should clarify. BiPAP is for a ventilation issue where you are not generating enough tidal volumes because you are having inefficient ventilation. That's the purpose of BiPAP. I'm giving you two different pressures to give you a tidal volume of five mils per kilogram, which you couldn't generate on your own because you have lost your elastic recoil. In obstructive sleep apnea, the guy has fantastic diaphragm and elastic recoil and all that stuff. So actually, if I asked him to breathe out fast, he just go, Whoo! he has no obstructive defect. Therefore, he does not need two different levels. CPAP is all he needs because he's got collapsing of the nasal passages and that to be forced open just needs a bit of pressure to breathe against. I mean, you could use BiPAP, I suppose, and it would probably work, but, uh, but it's unnecessary. Uh, and it's, you know, in that situation, CPAP is just a simpler and it works. So, so why would you bother? Is magnesium used in a similar way uh, in a severe asthma attack? I have seen it used. It's not in the guideline anywhere. Um, I gotta be honest with you, if you're reaching for IV magnesium for someone's breathlessness, then you really are, you're plucking at straws and stuff. Like I, I have seen it used, I'm pretty sure it's not in the guideline, but in an emergency, you just throw the kitchen sink at it. So I'll say it's not typically used, just like theophylines are not typically used anymore, really on the front line. Um, isn't OSA an obstructive defect by nature? Yeah, but it's not obstructive because of small airways. It's obstructive because of upper airways. So it's different. If you ask them to breathe hard and fast, they're fine, unless they're sleeping. If you ask him to breathe hard and fast when he's asleep, well, he won't because he's asleep. But, but the point is that uh, it's uh, obstructive because of the upper airway passages. It's not something lower down. This, this, is, where, this is where we shouldn't get too uh, hung up. We should just look at it logically and not get super hung up on the exact, oh, obstructive versus restrictive, and therefore there's an algorithm. Yeah, some things are not that perfect. You just got to think about it. This guy is obstructive only when he sleeps and it's only in the nasal passages. He's not obstructive when he's waking up, walking around and running you know, marathons. He's fine. It's just when he's asleep. Okay, goodness me. Okay, guys, I'm gonna take this last question and I'm gonna run because I need to catch a train <laughs> uh, and go on a little mini holiday this weekend. Can you explain about the mechanism of NIV again? Yes, okay. So non-invasive ventilation is you breathing against a pressure. Okay, let me bring it up. Hang on, where's the slide? Uh, I think it was this one. Yeah, okay, yeah. So non-invasive ventilation is you breathing against a pressure. If you breathe against a pressure, your distal airway passages are splinted open because you're breathing against pressure. And you can test that yourself by breathing through, uh, through lips as if you're kissing or you're blowing a whistle or something. Uh, so if you breathe against very tightly closed lips, you will feel, trying to breathe hard through that, you will feel that your uh, abdomen it has a little bit of pressure in it. You're, breathe, you're feeling the pressure you're breathing against in the stomach and in your kind of lower diaphragm. What you're feeling there is actually the fact that your distal airway passages are splinted open. That's what you're doing in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You are splinting them open and preventing the collapse. And therefore, you are reducing the obstructive defect and reducing the, um, you're increasing your tidal volume. You're helping with the work of breathing because you're giving them a pressure to breathe with as well. So that does improve things and makes them rest a bit. Uh, and fundamentally, you're increasing the tidal volume, which improves their gas exchange. Overall, you can describe that as improving the ventilation diffusion mismatch. I hope that kind of makes sense. I hope that makes sense anyway. Okay, dead silence. Everyone is stunned or no one has heard a word I said and I've just been speaking to the darkness. Okay, guys, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, that's all right. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, uh, the reason I'm not doing cardiology teaching, even though actually that is much easier for me to teach, uh, it's because uh, to be completely honest, I, I don't have many other <laughs> speciality people teaching. So I thought I'd do something for a bit of fun. And COPD is so much fun. Maybe I should do something else next time. All right. Uh, I think this was great, actually. Thank you for the... I'm just going for two days. I'm not going on a massive holiday. And it's a work conference kind of thing. So it's not, not actually chilling. Oh, recording. Um, I've tried recording this. I need to have a look at what the audio sounds like. If it sounds okay, I'll put it on. I have to say, I don't want to record these, but we'll see. Uh, I'll see how it goes. Please, please, please do come.